Okay. Thank you. Um, so I'm uh, Neil Redfern. Um, I work for Historic England. I'm a principal inspector of ancient monuments. Um, I run a team who are responsible for development management advice in Yorkshire. And what I wanted to do was just take you through, in, in some senses, some of my experiences, but also to really go at the heart of um, the theory of heritage management and how that theory, in some respects, sort of goes AWOL in the real world, and actually how we might actually sort of challenge that. And this comes out of a session I did at our staff conference. We had a soapbox session, and I was given five minutes to just have a little bit of a rant, and I ranted about this, okay? And so what I've done is I've just um, visualised it, and I visualise it through this image here. So this is all about letting go, because I do believe loss can be really good for us. Okay, and I'm going to explore loss and failure as we go through this. Now, the reason why I use this and I use images like this, and yesterday I, I did do a presentation about Lego movie and how that helps me, is because the person who has taught me the most about applying theory and using theory in my entire archaeological career has been my 12 year old daughter. Okay, because if I can't talk to her and convince her, I failed, uh, you know, in a sense I failed. And why, what am I saying there? Is my daughter doesn't have any of the baggage that I've acquired over 46 years, yeah? So she gives me really clear responses back. Really, really clear answers, okay? And I think that's something we should actually take back. Sometimes we've overthought and we've overlearned, okay? Not saying that thought and learning is bad, but actually how we use it is really, really important. Now, in the real world, what I do a lot is stuff around heritage at risk. Uh, Historic England is obsessed with heritage at risk. And I think this obsession is deeply damaging because it drives us in the wrong direction. And indeed, it's a semantic of, of one of the things that really um, uh, challenges me in the work that I actually do. And what I do, I'm going to borrow from another movie here. I'm going to quickly nip to Harry Potter and I'm going to talk about the unforgivable curses. And to me, in heritage management, there are three of them. Preservation, finite and non-renewable resource, and heritage lists. Okay? They are deathly. Okay? And they strangle all creativity. What do I mean by that? Well, I started um, Historic England as a field monument warden. I, I had a job where I had to go out and look at things. It's fantastic. But I was also given a, a rule kit. Okay, and that rule kit said that actually everything's finite and non-renewable. You've got to preserve it, yeah, and you've got to write down and list what you've done and list everything. Okay, and so I was told that ploughing and trees are bad for archaeology, bad, bad, bad. Okay, um, people bad for archaeology, <laughs> bad, bad, bad. Okay, really, people or interiors bad for people, uh, bad for archaeology. And this was just prevalent in, in everything I had to do. I was there to protect and save. Okay. This whole concept of finite and non-renewable resource, yeah, okay, fantastic. We don't dig, we don't dig. But hey, well, guys, when we do, we're actually going to call it preservation by record. So it's all right, despite the fact we are going to trash it, yeah, as archaeologists, we are going to implement that destruction. We're going to say we're doing a really good job because we're preserving it by record. Okay, I'd like to explore that at some other point, but I found it really interesting that there is this insatiable appetite to keep digging. But why? What are we actually trying to achieve? Then um, I managed to find myself doing a, a project for Historic England trying to define what major environmental threats were. So what does the heritage, what's the big roller coaster issue that's going to come on, come towards us and send us off a cliff? And, you know, so it's climate change, and it's all that argument, and it's dewatering, yeah, fine, I don't have a problem with that. But what I found really, really fascinating is the question we wouldn't grapple with, the thing we wouldn't grapple with that I was really interested in is, what do you do about inevitable loss? We're going to lose stuff. What do we do with it? Okay, what do we do in our organisation? We run the other way. Okay, because the idea of inevitable loss and preservation don't go together. So we just don't, we don't, we don't even talk about it. We hide. We don't want to go there. Okay. Now what's fascinating in doing all this work is there's actually a con totally counter approach. It's totally different. Okay, so my nice monument that was being trashed by motorbike riders in Leeds actually 
was only a tiny part of that monument. And in another part of that same scheduled monument, there was this beautiful example of basically it's a mine. Okay? And so my point was, can we get a big, big signpost and just point all the mountain bikers there, please? Yeah? Because I don't mind them doing that, because actually over there it's fine. Why worry? It's not a risk, it's fine. Okay? This example, trees are really bad. Okay? So this is an um, Iron Age um, defensive dike system. It's known as the Aberford Dikes. And as you can see, beautiful earth bank. I was told these trees are really, really bad, okay, and that I should cut them down. Interestingly, if you turn around 180 degrees from that point, you see that photograph of the same bank. Okay? And the reason why it looks like that is 10 years previously, the trees have been cut down to allow an electricity pylon across. Okay? So there are electric wires going there. So my point is, these trees aren't bad, they're doing a really good job. They're going to live for two to three hundred years, way past my employability, okay? They're looking after that monument. Us interfering is causing a problem. We are bringing the issues of loss and risk and stuff like that. And we really need to understand that concept about what we do to places. And so I started applying this differently. Let's be creative. Let's let it go. So here we have a lovely monument. This is a Bronze Age dike system with naughty mountain bikers on it. Okay? The National Park archaeologist <coughs> said, get rid of the, uh, the mountain bikers, throw them away. They're not allowed here. Let's sow them somewhere else in the wood. I actually met one of these mountain bikers, and he was said, I hate this. This mud slows me down, stops me. I don't want mud. Okay? And if you look, they built a causeway and they walked around the side. And I said, OK, so what happens if we helped you and we built something to help you cycle down this fantastic Bronze Age dike system? He said, really, would you do that? I said, yeah, let's do it. Let's build you a line down it. So this is me on my urban mountain bike <laughs> uh, going down it, which, of course, once I did this, they then told me, well, it's a black run, Neil, so it's like high technical proficiency. So literally there are drops and things like this. And I'm like, oh, my God, that's really scary. <laughs> I did the safest little bit. But what was fascinating was um, uh, they loved it. We'd only built 10 metres of it. The damn things were cycling down it like no one's business. And the guys who built it were all mountain bikers. Okay? The monument's absolutely fine. And the interpretation is a guy on his mountain bike zooming into a landscape from the Bronze Age. Yeah? And what I really like about this one, of course, is when they fall off their bike, I can tell them it was their ancestors from 5,000 years ago who made them fall off their bikes. I can have a proper conversation about the past with them, or the future, or whatever we want to talk about. The other thing I've encountered in my uh, working experience, which is absolutely fantastic, is um, how we are so scared to talk about places that have suffered loss and then what we do with them. This is Whitby Abbey. This is Whitby Abbey today. Okay. This is Whitby Abbey in 2005, but the one thing we don't tell you about Whitby Abbey is what happened in 1914. So that's 1905, sorry. 1914, German high seas fleet sailed up the east coast, did a little bit of bombing, boom, 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 oops, hit Whitby Abbey, blew it up, basically. What we did after the war, the Ministry of Works, my predecessors, we rebuilt it. Now, how do you feel about that now I've told you this story? Because if you go to Whitby Abbey, we won't tell you that story. We will say, this is an authentic ruin. Rubbish. Okay? We lie to you. Because actually what this is, is, well, I'll call it what you like. Consolidated ruin, re reimagined. The best thing about it is between, let me get my photo right, between 1914, this one's 1914, and 1919, a bit more fell down, and this medieval stair turret was actually uncovered. Okay. When they rebuilt it, they hid it because they went back to 1905. And actually, there is no archaeological evidence left there of this. So you actually can go to this photograph to actually understand that there's actually very detailed phasing in here. So we, we don't even tell the right story when we're actually doing it. So again, what I find really amazing is how we're dealing with all this. This is about loss and, you know, is, it, is the fact we've got bomb failure? What is that? I don't know. But again, it's my whole approach that actually... Is, is it bad? I don't mind them doing that. I just wish they'd tell the story, because I think the story is fascinating. Okay? And we, we encounter this all over the place. And then this whole idea of a ruin comes into my mind, and what does it, what does it actually mean? Okay, Revo Abbey, I've shown this photo loads of times. Revo Abbey today, Revo Abbey in the 1920s, Ministry of Works effectively clearing it, tidying it up, making it look like the abbey you see today. So, yeah, all a bit fake. The archaeology was just pushed into a field next door, and you can go to it. But you've got to ask yourself, what is a ruin? Okay, a ruin is something that it falls down. It gets worse. It gets worse. This doesn't do that anymore. Is it a ruin? What are we saying about our past when we're actually looking at this? And what do we want to do? You know, that whole ruination 
process, which I'm really fascinated about. And why are we so scared of it? Why don't we do something different? It's not failure to let stuff go. What is it? Um, one of the big pieces of work I've been involved in over the past five years is, well, actually, no, scarily, actually, it goes back 13, 14 years, is the upgrade of the A1 through Yorkshire, which just basically has just struck gold with its archaeology. There's just been so much, okay? And uh, it's just the stories that come out, it's gone through scheduled monuments for a lot. Um, the current phase, which is only 10 miles long, is up to 12 million pounds of archaeology. Okay, not bad, really good, yeah, 12 million pounds of archaeology. What the Highways England will actually say is the archaeological delays have cost us 37 million pounds. So when we look at that money and saying 300 million, and oh, isn't that great, that's not the real cost. The cost is all the development and everything else that actually goes on that doesn't come to archaeology. We can actually get in the way of development quite, quite severely. But what's absolutely fascinating is this, this process has been one that has been entirely archaeological focused. This, to me, I, I get dis depressed by this because it's archaeology for archaeologists. Okay? All the product has been for archaeologists. And this goes back to my point I made earlier under the MPPF on what is mitigation. Yeah? What is expert archaeological investigation? Well, it's a real clique. What's fascinating about the A1 in Yorkshire, here it is, okay, is that if you analyse the parishes in this place, the A1 actually is the parish boundary for about 20 parishes. Why? Because this has been a cultural thing in this landscape for 2,000 years. Not one archaeological strategy applied in this landscape on that road related to the parishes. Not one question. Nothing. Nothing related to where all the people live. Why do all the people live there? Not one public footpath actually crosses this road in this area. Because they never did. The only thing that crosses it is the Trans-Pennine route, which is an entirely 20th century invention. Okay? Really fascinating how we've not even scratched the surface of this. Now, um, we had a really brilliant discussion earlier this morning, again, about sort of this idea about developers asking what's good archaeology and what's bad archaeology. Okay, well, so the road builders uh, um, basically looked at us as bad archaeology because we were creating lots and lots of delays. But because we're going through Catterick, okay, Catterick is a big, big MOD place, okay, so we actually got Operation Nightingale involved and we found them a bit of a scheduled monument and we said, why don't we do a bit of Operation Nightingale there? And the joint venture paid for it and they did it. And this is the uh, Operation Nightingale in the process. Really, really brilliant. It's really exciting. Okay, and what? Guess what? What was so fascinating is the director of the joint venture. He basically said, "Oh, I like this. This is good archaeology." Yeah, helping Operation Nightingale was good archaeology. Okay, <coughs> the rest of the scheme, they had the twelve million pounds, was bad archaeology because it was causing him a headache. So actually, yes, we do have a conversation about good archaeology, and it goes back to my point because the legacy issue here is completely different. Our product is completely different. It's not that banal fact-finding, artefact-driven process. It's about people. We make our pro thing about people and put people into that process. It's far more interesting. And we actually tried to do this in places on the A1 with two pieces of work that were done. One was a conversation with the MOD and veterans who had served in Afghanistan. And one of the things we wanted to do was explore the whole process of artefact creation and what they did when they went to Afghanistan with their possessions. And there was a conversation about what was their most important possession. And what these soldiers came back with, and they said, is CDs. CDs of absolutely anything were really, really, really important to us. Okay. And I said, oh, that's fantastic. How did you store them? I said, oh, that was the thing. CD cases were a complete and utter waste of time. We didn't have any room in our kit bags for CD cases. So what did they do with the CD cases? They threw them all away. So if you go to Afghanistan now, the archaeological record would be CD cases. So what do we do when we're at this Roman site on Catterick, Roman fort, Roman military uh, installation? How can we start having that conversation with the archaeologists about material they're actually digging up? A completely different conversation actually starts to happen. We also spoke to the Gurkhas. There's a very big Gurkha regiment in, in Yorkshire. And we had a conversation with them about what possessions they bring from Nepal to England when they come and serve as, as, a, as a Gurkha soldier. And it was fascinating. Um, they said, oh yeah, you have all the buttons, the coins, the knives, you know, their, 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 their knife they come with them. And so they listed it all out. We then asked them to start exploring what were the really important things to them. Okay? And what was fascinating is the thing that was most important to them was a very tiny piece of material 
that is normally given by a member of their family to them as a, as a, as a way of their family remembering them. And that was the most precious thing they had. And of course, when you look at it and you start talking about that in an archaeological parallel, that textile is the one thing that would never survive in the archaeological record most of the time. So again, when we find hobnail boots <coughs> and when we find coins and we go, wow, look at this exciting stuff, actually what we're finding is the stuff they all threw away, the stuff they didn't care about losing. Okay? But how do we actually reflect this in actually how we set up our dialogues and narratives about it? And then my last one about the A1, again, is this... Uh, this is a whole concept of how we stick value on these things. Um, I was involved in the uh, discovery and the excavation of this chariot burial. Okay? And um, there's lots of reasons why it shouldn't have been excavated, why it shouldn't be dug up. It should have been spotted much, much sooner. Anyway, it was. And what I found fascinating is everyone, as soon as they saw this, they thought this person must be a really, really important person, really, really great person. And, you know, we start to apply all of our... Uh, you know, preconceived ideas on it. And I said, oh, it's interesting, he's on the magnesium limestone ridge. Maybe he was the policeman of his day. Maybe he was looking at who was travelling north and south on the magnesium limestone ridge through Yorkshire and Nottinghamshire. And the reason why the uh, chariot was excavated was they needed to build a bridge over the, um, M1, uh, the A1 at this location. And that bridge was built so a farmer could cross the A1 and so the police could turn around, okay, so they could go in the other way. Um, about five months after this, my colleague Keith Emmerich was driving to watch his beloved Huddersfield town and he was driving on the M62 too fast, okay, and he was pulled over by a policeman and he had to go and sit in the back of the policeman's car and when he was there, he was asked what he did and he said, uh, reluctantly, he's very reluctant in saying this, he said, I'm an archaeologist and at which point the two policemen in the front of the car started an entirely different conversation because for their morning tea break, they used to go and park on top of that bridge because one of the policemen liked to look out over the landscape and he knew that he was next to a henge monument, he knew about this burial and he liked to understand how the sun rose over this landscape. Okay, boom, boom, my heritage policeman, he's there on that bridge. Okay. Wow, what a conversation to actually start happening. He, uh, he, he got his fine. He didn't get let off. <laughs> yeah, have you know. But again, to me, this is about creativity. And I think this is really important. You know, I mentioned hidden costs, but this is really important when we talk about HS2. Yeah? What, are, what is our legacy of all that archaeology? Quite frankly, I would start with doing nothing. Okay? Not until we do something radically different. Because otherwise, we're just going to create a giant pile of stuff. I'll worry at the moment we don't have enough archaeologists to deal with it. I don't care about whether we've got enough archaeologists. There is never, ever going to be in this universe enough academics to deal with the output that's actually produced. So why are we doing it? Yeah, there aren't, There's enough museum space. I would advocate a radical, radical different approach, but uh, that's me. Okay, another one really exploring this idea of loss. In 2003, I was the inspector who had to almost one weekend run out to stop fire engines from digging up loads of scheduled monuments on this moorland when it went up in smoke. Boosh, it went up. Two and a half square miles. We knew there were 30 scheduled rock art sites on it. There was about 250 sites on the historic environment record. After this fire, we did a rapid um, survey and we actually encountered two and a half thousand things. No, sorry. Yes, no, two and a half thousand sites. We went from 250 to two and a half thousand. So the density was extraordinary. You could find a ditch that would have been dug with a spade width survived in this landscape. Absolutely extraordinary. And we did a lot of work, we did some recording. But as part of that, uh, we found this stone. Okay, and um, yeah, it was all fascinating. You get really excited. Look at that, what can it be? And all this. And um, uh, we laser scanned it. <laughs> Um, we then played around with it and we twiddled it around and this is my probably my biggest failure ever in archaeology I stood there and went wow picture map yeah picture map house sky hills field systems yep and we thought oh wow isn't that really fascinating could this be um, we then did some publicity we told we told everyone about this and uh, I spoke about this, and I can tell you for the next six months, I had a vitriol of abuse from archaeologists saying, how could you call that a map? Of, and one, of the person, one person wrote a 16-page essay on the entire subject and basically said that he'd recognised this motif from a certain type of beaker pottery, this motif was in a different beaker pottery, this motif was in a third bit of pottery. Okay? And he analysed every single different type of motif on it. The one thing he never did was put it back together in a single picture. 
Okay? But as part of the publicity when we actually did this, what I actually said was, uh, in the public, uh, and yes, and we reburied it. And that just created all sorts of problems. What do you mean you've reburied it? How could you rebury our heritage? It's supposed to be in a museum. Well, what's actually fascinating is how this thing was discovered. Uh, this is when it was first discovered. Uh, this is the classic archaeologist. Okay. Um, the, I think it was the next day, a family then discovered it. They were called the Hope family. Okay. Um, by two weeks later, I'd have four archaeologists claiming they'd discovered this find. Okay. I had the National Park archaeologists insisting that I should prosecute for criminal damage to a scheduled monument. The family had dug it up. That all the other archaeologists had actually done the, done the same. None of them actually spoke to them. We paid for an emergency excavation um, on, a, on only a tiny small part of it. Because what we didn't actually say is this was part of a very large funeral monument which actually had a stone curb where when we excavated it, every other stone had rock art on it. Okay? And I refused to allow anyone to take it out of there because I said it would be like pulling out gold teeth from someone's mouth. This place is about its place. Yeah? But really interestingly, how our, we use our language, almost this was immediately turned into a piece of failure. Whereas actually what we were also doing is trying to avoid the sea henge conversation that had happened at the same time. This wasn't about ripping it out and sending it off to a museum. This was about understanding the place and what you actually do with it. <coughs> so again, I think it's really interesting that actually when you try and do the right thing, you still get het up. Because people have got this ingrained answer about what actual heritage is. The other great thing about it, this fire, <coughs> is that a whole load of artists went out there and created art about it. And they created amazing new stories and totes spoke to, to the fire brigade and actually the testimonies from the fire brigade are actually really quite extraordinary. I've also been really lucky um, to uh, have to be responsible for dealing with the outcomes of the 2015 floods in Yorkshire. Okay? And these are uh, uh, three of the listed buildings that were damaged. Yeah? Oh my god, all these listed buildings absolutely damaged, what are we going to do, what are we going to do? Uh, and people got just so het up about it. Well, I've seen all these bridges back to being reconstructed, and I can tell you something, that for each of these communities, they've been an, actually an inspiring event, and that actually I've seen communities come together like I've never seen them come together before, because they've had a bit of adversity and they've got to get over some issues. And they actually, when the bridges were open, they started celebrating, they actually started talking to each other. Okay? So this idea that losing heritage is a failure and loss is bad, I, I just don't agree with. I think it actually can drive a whole load of different conversations that are really interesting. We have it in York as well. Uh, York flooded at the same time, big hoo-ha about what to do. I'm now talking to the Environment Agency about their wanting to um, re-energise the flood defences. Okay, they want to, in places, raise the flood defences by a metre. In other places, they want to put in three metre-plus high flood defences. They will only work until 2039. Okay? So I've said, why aren't we rescaling the city? Maybe it's just about time we knocked it down and actually started rebuilding it again. Okay? Because this row of houses here will have a two metre high wall in front of it. What is the point? Okay? How do you live in that sort of place? Okay? Why don't we help them rebuild their houses in a way that can actually deal with that? And if you think I'm stupid, the Roman archaeology in York is seven or eight metres below the ground surface. It's not like it hasn't happened before. Okay? I'll put this in because Hannah mentioned it. It wasn't in my original presentation. The other thing we've got to do is we've got to start making buildings more resilient. Now, this is a drain pipe where someone pinched the end of it. Okay? And I took this photograph with water coming up. Okay? And what was fascinating, I was really happy they replaced it. And I, yes, that's what we need to do. Someone's done a really good repair. I do actually have to admit, I have another photograph taken from last month where they've gone round and all four they've repinched. So it's like, when it rains, okay, they go and pinch them shut. And when it doesn't rain, they open up again. It's ridiculous. We, you know, these buildings can't cope with the water that we're actually taking. We need a different approach. We need proper guns on these things. And that needs, you know, really good design and creativity. And we shouldn't be worried about <coughs> losing these ones. This is my favourite. I got asked after giving this presentation on, on climate change. Um, someone came up to me. It wasn't in this place. And they said, oh, we've got all these anti-tank blocks and they're about to fall into the sea. And, you know, we've got this great idea. We're going to move them. We're going to move them back from where they are. Take them back 10 metres. And I'm like, why? Oh, so we can save them. I said, as soon as you move them, they have no context of why they were there. They were there to stop tanks there. Okay? Just let them fall into the sea. He said, oh, can you really do that? 
And I said, yes, the other thing that was fascinating about these anti-tank blocks is everybody who actually goes swimming on that beach, each family's adopted one, they've got artwork all over them. So whilst they were built for an emergency, their subsequent history over 60 years has never really been explored, what you actually do with them. And they've got a completely different story when you look at it. Excavating archaeology. Um, I love stark art, and, um, and it's a really good example of archaeology, but one of the reasons why I was really happy we dug this is because there was a generational exploration of archaeological value going on. Okay, So the team that dug it were taught Mesolithic archaeology by the team that dug it in the 80s, who were taught Mesolithic archaeology by the team who dug it in the 60s. And what you actually see is, through that process, the emergence of archaeological theory, really groundbreaking critical theory. Okay, okay. So we can't just treat this stuff as precious. We've got to get in and play around. And that's really my final question. Yeah? What is loss? What is inevitable loss? That's Whitby Abbey. This is Reculver Towers. They are going to fall into the sea. There is no doubt about it. Okay? I'd love to build a trebuchet and just start hurling rocks at this one. I'd love to ask the community there, would they like a folly in their garden? Knock it down, give them it. What you could do with Bram Stoker and that church falling into the sea, I just... The possibilities and the imagination know no bounds. Okay? And that really is my concluding point. Not let it go and just lose it. Do something imaginative with it. Build a snowman. Okay? It's not about just saying, oh, it's inevitable. Yeah? We, ca we are creative people, and we should actually think of our heritage and this whole process as that. And that's why I think we need a different <coughs> theory. We need a different process. Everything needs to change, okay, from my point of view. And it shouldn't be about preservation. It shouldn't be about finite and non-renewable resource. It actually needs to be about creativity and cultural value. And that all exists in our heads. And that's where we should actually start playing around with it. Thanks.